Prince Harry's book, Spare, continues to break records right around the globe by exposing the royal family as never before. And now a new book pulls the curtains back even further and exposes the other side, including why a former aide describes dealing with Harry and Meghan like dealing with teenagers. Here it is here, courtiers, intrigue, ambition, and the power players behind the House of Windsor has a lot of people talking and in a Canadian television exclusive. We're joined from London by the book's author, Valentine Lowe. Valentine, welcome to The Morning Show. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. All right. Valentine, can you, we begin with uh, a bit of a history lesson first. What exactly does a courtier do? A courtier is like a chief of staff for a member of the royal family, and they do all sorts of things. They very obviously they write their speeches, they advise them on policy, um, they they they're their gatekeeper. They control who they get to see. They organise their diary. You know what official engagements they carry out, and very importantly, they're kind of with them. A lot of the time, every day, hours on end. So there, it's a very, very close relationship. And you know, the principal, the, the member of the royal family, really depends on the private secretary. Jeff mentioned this off the top. Prince Harry's former aide saying that dealing with Harry and Meghan was like dealing with teenagers. How so? I think they were very difficult. They had, well, they were different in two different ways. I mean, Harry, he's always had this obsession with the, with the media, as we, we've learned from reading Spare, uh, and he used to get really cross about things, and they'd have to deal with that. But, um, and Meghan also, she didn't kind of settle in that well to the royal family. She, in some ways, she did, but she had a, she had her own clear ideas about what she wanted to do, and she didn't. It's like she didn't quite get what being a royal was. I mean, famously, as I reveal in the book, when they went on tour to Australia, their first major tour, she was kind of rather taken aback by the crowds and said. I can't believe I'm not getting paid for this. Um, so she, she she had a very kind of different idea of what it is to be a role, and, and they would have rounds. I mean, f famously when um, in the summer of uh, 2019, um, Harry took uh, four private jets in in a space for very few days, uh, and he, he'd have stand up rounds with his staff and. and they were just very, very difficult to deal with. Um, very stubborn, um, fixed ideas. Uh, and the courtiers tried to explain to them, you know, we've got to deal with the real world. The media, for instance, is here to stay. It's not going to go away. But it was a message that was falling on deaf ears. Now, Valentine, you also write about Harry refusing to meet with William at times, claiming he was afraid their conversations might be leaked to the press. Was that fear, was it justified, and how did they ultimately communicate? Well, this particular incident uh, was um, around the time of the documentary about uh, Harry and Meghan's tour of Africa, when clearly both of them were in a bad way, and William was reaching out to them and said, listen, you know, things are not going right, can I come see you? And Harry initially says, yeah, OK, yeah, come and see us. Uh, and then he says, well, who do you have to tell? Uh, and he says, well, I've got to tell my private secretary because I've got to change my diary. Uh, and William says, so Harry says, well, in that case, don't come because, as you say, fear of it being leaked. I think Harry, he's got a strange idea. He's got a, a, fix, a fixed a fixation that the palace was leaking bad stuff about him. Now, yes, stories did come out, but I, I don't recognise this idea of the palace on a systematic basis leaking negative stories about Harry and Meghan. It's just not my experience. And I've spoken to f fellow royal correspondents. It's not their experience either. Um, so... Um, the meeting never happened. It's was, it was tragic. It was one possible way in which those two brothers might have started to improve their relationship, but never happened. Um, you know, I guess they they continued to WhatsApp, um, which is one of their favourite method, methods of communication. But also, they did what members of the royal family always do. They've got this structure around them. They've got these people who work for them. Uh, and they use their people to communicate. It's weird. You thought, you know, in your own personal family relations, if you want to talk to your brother or your sister or your aunt or your mum or your granny, uh, you pick up the phone and ring them yourself. 
in the royal family, yes, that sometimes happens, but also they use their courtiers to communicate. So, Valentine, are you saying that you disagree with Prince Harry's comments about the comms teams who work for senior members of the royal family, that they work against each other for their principal? No. I mean, it's certainly true that um, different households can battle against each other, can jockey for position, uh, try and get the best media, the best uh, dower engagements for their principal. But the, the idea that um, the different households were briefing against Harry, I don't recognise that. Now, of course, it did happen quite badly in the days of Charles and Diana when that marriage was, was going south. Uh, but I think even then, it wasn't so much the actual households briefing uh, against each other as people just outside the household. That was the main culprit. Although it, it also happened within the household. There, were, there was, um, particularly around the time of um, when Camilla was being rehabilitated, uh, there was someone who used to uh, do a lot of a very energetic briefing there. But I, I don't recognise it uh in the Harry and William era. I mean, William was very careful, very kind of punctilious. He didn't want to stir up um, ill feelings in the family. It's not the way William operates. Uh, so it's this is not a picture I recognise. And welcome back to TMS and our Canadian television exclusive with Valentine Lowe, author of Courtier's Intrigue, Ambition and the Power Players behind the House of Windsor. Valentine, we've heard a lot about Angela Kelly, a courtier who worked for the late Queen. She was her closest aide. Uh, in his memoir, Harry labeled her as a troublemaker. Can you tell us more about her and why Harry gave her that label? Um, he gave her that label because I think she was a match for him. She wouldn't take any nonsense from him. Um, and their most significant uh, contretemps was uh, over the tiara that Meghan was going to wear for the wedding. And um, they had a, the row wasn't over which tiara to wear. That was all sorted out uh, earlier. Um, they had a meeting with the Queen. Meghan tried on a few tiaras, chose one. That was all lovely. The problem was trying it on because you can imagine if you're going to wear a tiara, you've got to have your hair right. So an appointment was made uh, with Meghan's hairdresser, and then she wanted to have the tiara so, she, so the hairdresser could you know know what to do with her hair. But the problem was she hadn't fixed up with Angela Kelly. And Angela Kelly is the woman with the key. She's in charge of all the jewellery. She's very close to the Queen. And she's not a woman to be messed around with. She's a, she comes from a, a working class background. Her, her father was a, a crane driver in the Liverpool docks. Uh, and she is, she's a tough one, Angela. Her nickname is AK-47. Um, and uh, the day that Meghan's hairdresser turned up from Paris, I believe, um, they said, well, can we, we want the tiara now. And no one had told Angela Kelly this and said, well, I'm not here. And if I'm not here, you can't have the tiara. And Harry was absolutely furious. Apparently, he used some pretty some pretty choice language, uh, either at Angela Kelly or about her. And uh, Angela Kelly, I think, might have heard such language before. But anyway, she wasn't impressed. And, you know, one understands that the Queen had to have a word with Harry afterwards. All right, let's move from the uh, tiara to the dress next, if we could, Valentine, because another tension during the wedding preparations, of course, was this now much talked about dispute between Meghan and Princess Catherine regarding Charlotte's ill-fitting wedding dress. What more can you tell us about that? Well, this is a, this is a, an incident that's very hard to get to the bottom of. Um, you know, the original version we all heard was that uh, Meghan had made Kate cry. Uh, and then later, Harry says a version that, you know, the, it was Kate, sorry, it was Meghan who cried. He came back and found Meghan on the floor crying over some incident. Incredibly trivial about, you know, may, altering the bridesmaids' dresses so they would actually fit. Um, and what I do know is that uh, after this row between the two of them, Kate went round to Nottingham Cottage to Meghan with a bouquet of flowers uh, as a peace gesture, um, whether it was to say sorry or just to try and, you know, make everything nice. Uh, and certainly, according to one of my sources, Meghan shut the door in her face. Hmm. All right. 
That's a little nugget I hadn't heard of yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I also want to ask you, Valentine, uh, that about the idea aides believe that Meghan and Harry's exit from the palace was premeditated and that she wanted to be rejected by the royal family. Can you elaborate? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, when she first arrived, according to some people, her behavior was such, she, she was, she was talking about rejection or thinking about rejection right from the start in the very, very early days, shortly after her existence became known to all of us. Um, they they didn't like all the intrusion from the journalists. Um, Harry was desperate uh, for them, for the his press guy to put out a statement uh, criticising all the media who'd been sort of camped outside Meghan's flat in Toronto and so forth. Um, and uh, he was worried that uh, Meghan was going to dump him unless he did this. And very significantly, uh, Meghan uh, said to one of the senior people uh, in Harry's team, I know how this works. You don't care about the girlfriend. She, so rejection was on her mind straight from right, right from the start. But it's it, you shouldn't think about it in terms of merely Megan wanting rejection and you know plotting a way out, which is certainly what some people believe, because you got to realise that Harry was deeply up, uh, unhappy. He 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 didn't like his position in the royal family. He didn't like dealing with the media. He had a, a sense of frustration about trying to do some good in the world and felt the, the the senior courtiers of the palace were holding him back. All that fed on a sort of, and, and led to a sense of uh, uh, frustration on his part uh, and, and dissatisfaction. Um, and someone said, said to me, someone very senior who knew Harry well, they said to me, in a funny way, and, and this is a person who dis disapproves of what those two did. He said, in a funny way, Actually, she did them. He, she did him the greatest kindness, because we knew he was on. We we knew that he was unhappy, but we didn't know what to do about it, and she showed him a way out. And I think that's a very interesting way of looking at it. You mentioned Camilla a little earlier. Now Harry has long been critical of Queen Consort Camilla, especially in the new book. Is this criticism valid? And do you think it's now a line that's been crossed for King Charles? Charles will absolutely be upset about that. He 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 loves Camilla very much. He hates to see any criticism of her, and he will take it very badly. I think uh, that Harry should have said these things. Um, and Harry's also kind of wrong in one respect. Uh, he effectively accuses Camilla of leaking the contents of her first conversation with William. Whereas, in fact, it, it's well known that the person responsible for that was um, Camilla's private secretary, a woman called Amanda McManus, who leaked it by accident. She happened to say something to her husband, who happened to say something to someone else, and it ended up uh, reaching the Sun newspaper. But it wasn't a deliberate leak, so Harry's being very unfair to her. On the other hand, it has to be uh, accepted that Camilla did have working for her uh, a communications guy who was quite adept to the dark arts of, of, of leaking and planting stories. So, uh, you know, she may not be entirely blameless. All right. So having said all of that and taking all of this into account, Valentine, do you believe that there is reconciliation possible? Can the royal family come together? And if so, do you think it might happen in time for the king's coronation in May? I think it's going to be incredibly difficult. Wouldn't like to rule it out because I'm an eternal optimist. But if you think about it, one of the royal family's main complaints now is that they can't have a private conversation with Harry without it hitting the media in some form eventually. Um, and how, if you're going to have reconciliation, how do you do it? You have to have very difficult private conversations where both sides, you know, give some ground. Uh, and I don't really see how you have those conversations if one side doesn't trust the other to leak it or not to leak it to just put it there in the next book or television program so um the ground rules for those conversations are going to be very difficult um let's hope they can happen because you know one doesn't like to see a family tear itself apart 
because the rules have changed, that is for sure. As we always say here on the show, we are just scratching the surface when it comes to revelations and storylines. It's called Courtiers, Intrigue, Ambition, and the Power Players Behind the House of Windsor. It'll be released on January 24th. Valentine, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.